So I'm going to play a video real quick. If I can get this to work because it uh, has a mind of its own sometimes. That transformation started early in Jennifer Beagle's life. The youngest of seven kids with an alcoholic father and an abusive mother, her only thought was to survive. I never knew my parents loved me at all, ever. I don't remember one time. Ever. The only adult who showed Jennifer attention was her uncle. A man who molested her when she was seven. After that happened, I felt like a piece of that survival was ripped away from me. And there was just this major void in my life. I just existed. Jennifer found alcohol, drugs, and later sex helped to get her through. She was so out of control and her environment so unstable that at 14, she was taken by the state and sent into foster care. Being high gave me life. It numbed the pain of being molested and neglected and abandoned and abused and rejected. Life only got worse with her new family. Her foster dad raped her and soon after started giving her drugs for sex. The view of myself at that point was I'm the horror. I'm the whore, I'm the problem. I hated myself. By her mid-twenties, Jennifer was addicted to crack and had married and divorced twice. Then she lost custody of her son and ended up homeless, prostituting herself to support her habit. Jennifer's uncle became one of her regular customers. I knew what he had done to me seven was wrong, and I knew what he was doing to me now was wrong. went back to the drugs and life on the street. Fueling her was a growing rage toward the people who'd done her so much harm. I just hated them. I thought I was equipped to be able to handle this, but I was just, <coughs> I was bitter, I was hateful, I was empty. Then in her early 30s, Jennifer got in over her head with a new pimp, a dangerous man who constantly threatened to kill her. One day, she decided she would no longer bow to his demands and locked herself in a closet. I did not want to die that day. He's beating on the door, come out or you're dead. And I'm like, go away, I'm not coming out. And I cry out to God. Okay, God, I'm so done with this lifestyle. I'm so done living. You take my life. And in the closet, I heard an audible voice, but it was different. It brought peace to me brought a sense of, this is safe, I'm gonna be okay. He said, finally, Jennifer, finally, now I can do something with your life. The next thing Jennifer remembers is waking up and finding her captor was gone. She left the house and went to a nearby church. I asked this church for help and a group of women embraced me, loved me, nurtured me and counseled me. Not only did Jennifer stop using drugs, she got the courage to leave the man who'd been controlling her. Two months later at a church service, she fully surrendered her life to Christ. January 27th, I ran to the altar. I laid my life down at the altar and I wanted it. I wanted everything to be different. I pray, I pray, Jesus, I pray, Jesus. Jennifer says as she drew closer to God, he showed her some things hadn't changed. I had so much unforgiveness. I had so much bitterness. It ate me up every single day of my life. And he's saying that unless you forgive those, I can't forgive you. And that scared me because I wasn't always innocent on the streets. If God could forgive me, who was I not to forgive others? And I knew... 
as Jennifer moved forward with her new life in Christ, she began the long, often difficult process of forgiving those in her past who'd hurt her. I went through an entire list of people I wanted to forgive. I needed to forgive because every time I did, a piece of this heaviness would come off of me and I would feel lighter, I would feel peace, I would feel joy. This forgiveness was for me to be free. It was going to take some work, but freedom was there for me to take. And then the hardest of all. He finally convinced me to go to my uncle, and I did. We prayed, and he received Christ that day. Jennifer reconciled with the rest of her family, including her son. These days, she works with victims of trafficking and shares the love of Jesus with everyone she meets. Her lighthearted joy is contagious. Jesus has changed my heart in every way. I have a new normal. I like my new normal. I like loving people. I want people to know that the love of Jesus is unstoppable. I get to say so. Please welcome Jennifer Beagle. Listen, I feel right at home. I have already taken my shoes off. <laughs> All the women in the house said amen because <laughs> they were high heels and I'm, I'm short, so I contemplated if I was going to even be able to stand at this table and see anything, but here I am. <laughs> Um, I can't put them back on because I really can't get down there to do that. So, <laughs> hi, my name is Jennifer and I'm a food addict, so <laughs> but I'm okay. I do just have to laugh. Where's the gentleman that was passing out the chips? I'm on day three of no Diet Coke. <laughs> and I just need to know if you have any enemies because I'm willing to do this cheap because I am angry. Okay, <laughs> so... Oh, it's Holy Week, so I said, Lord, okay, I'll give up what's closest to my heart, and today that's Diet Coke. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored. You saw just a bit of my story, and I'm so grateful to be able to share even more with you. I think one of the things, I take notes. I mean, I don't get to see myself on, on film often, right? Who does, right? So I'm taking notes as if that's somebody else. And I'm like, wow, I said that. That was actually really good. Um, because it's true. And that is Jesus is safe. He is safe. I, I'm from Gainesville, Florida. I'm a Gator fan. I don't care what you think. <laughs> Bro. Okay. Bro. Right. I got you. Um, so I started my story in that area. And then um, I moved up here about three years ago. This is my second time in Kentucky. I'm here to stay. But um, I'm going to go backwards a little bit and start again from that childhood. And I don't know how much time I have. I know we're running a little late. But I'm, I'm, I talk fast. So listen fast. Okay? All right. Great. So, um I'm 51 years old today. Never in my life did I ever think that I would get this old. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, how'd that happen? <laughs> As I can't get down to my shoes. So um, when I was a baby, it's not so untypical. Like everybody's family is dysfunctional today. Every, you know, back in the day, we used to say, when you had a dysfunctional family, what goes on in the home stays in the home. Well, that's everywhere today. So that's not so uncommon, abnormal, whatever adjective you want to use for that. But it just still stands true. You couldn't say anything in my family. My dad was a severe alcoholic, very, very, very abusive. 
He would rape my mother in front of us, put guns to her head in front of us, make all of us line up and watch it, call her the, my mom was an adulterer. She would sleep with anything that would move. She's given birth to five children. All of us have different dads. Like we, that was my childhood. And again, that's not so uncommon because it was also my children's childhood. But in saying that, when I became seven years old and I find my uncle grooming me to molest me, I knew that I didn't have that family that I could approach. I couldn't tell them that something just did not feel right. Something was wrong. So when he molested me, it took a piece of me. I knew that this was wrong. It didn't feel right, but I didn't know what to do with that. We never had any love, any compassion, certainly no Jesus in our home. So I just continued on with life. I'm the baby of the seven. By the time I'm nine and 10 years old, I um, start drinking my dad's beer. I would go and I would tip it and they'd be like, oh, look at little Jenny. She's so cute, drinking all those beer. And I was like, yeah, I'm so cute. And then by the time I'm 10 and 11, I'm a full-blown alcoholic and they're locking it up and hiding it from me. At 11 years old, I needed it. It took me to a place of numbness and I needed that in my life because between all of the abuse, all of the adultery from my family, the molestation, I was so dead inside. <coughs> that I needed to be numb. I started acting out in school, got in foster care, got, or got in trouble, got in foster care, ended up in a foster home where my foster dad was considerably older than me and he had a bunch of farm hands and his wife had had surgery where they used to give prescription speed. You young folk don't even know, okay? <laughs> so you, just, you just don't, I mean. So he would give me her prescriptions and for exchange for me and then exchange to his farm hands and this was just a normal life though have you ever just stopped and think this is normal this is the only thing I know I thought that all the time but something still did not sit right in my mind even though it was normal ended up Going back to my mom from foster care, running away from home. I lived in this small town, much like Buckner, okay? Uh, where am I at? Shelbyville. So yeah, much like Buckner, one traffic light, nobody, unless you're out in the woods. So that's how I grew up. Everything that went on, shh, it's okay. Just don't tell anybody. So ran away from home from somewhere like Buckner to Chicago, Illinois, and uh, was introduced to some gang life at 16 years old. They shot at me, I peed my pants, I left. Okay, <laughs> that's literal, I'm like, I'm scared. That is something that I don't even know how to handle. Came back, started living with older men, started uh, more and more drugs, more and more drugs, more and more drugs. And um, I don't know how you guys do it here, Dennis, what you talk about, what you don't talk about. Well, let me tell you something. This is my story. <clears throat> And I, I tell it in a raw fashion. I tell it very raw because I don't think we talk enough about the real pain. I think we sugarcoat it. I think you, I'm so grateful for what you said that this is such a loving church to the addicted because I have been in church for 20 years now and I've seen some just kind of sweep it under the rug as you sit out in those pews and you be silent. I can't be that person. So I'm a little raw. If you um, want to correct me afterwards, I dare you. So um, anyway, at 19 years old, I had my first child, and I married a man that was twice my age. He was ready to settle down. He was ready to get married. I'm 19, young and wild, and I dare you. So <laughs> I had my first baby as a teenager, left him. Uh, he was a good guy. I didn't know. He was foreign, completely foreign, like speaking Korean to me. I had no idea what was going on. Divorced him, married a second man that was just like my father with my mother, and that was where I was comfortable. Alcohol, drugs, abuse, a lot of horrific things happened in that. 
One of those horrific things is that he moved his sister in with us. His sister said, oh, she's a pretty little thing. Do you want to try this crack? And I had tried everything else. Sure, why not? I will do anything. I, I don't care. I mean, I did not care. And you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So I did. And we ran out. And she's like, let's go to the dope man. And uh, she said, let's go to the dope man. We'll get some more. You just flirt with him. I said, well, I know how to do that. So I did. And we go. We get some free stuff. Run out. Go back a second time. Get some free stuff. Go back a third time. And he's like, no, 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 little missy. Now. Now. It's my turn. And that was the first time that I um, found myself in a rundown mobile home trailer out in the woods, no running water, no electric, no windows, sheets over the windows. I smoked cigarettes for years, so this is no knock on it. I'll choose my battles, but cigarette hanging out of his mouth, ashes flying everywhere. And he told me what to do, and I did it. I needed crack just like that became my drug of choice for many years. I ended up within six months um, walking out of my second marriage. No big deal. He was going to kill me anyway and tried many times. Uh, the cops were always at our house for fighting, for screaming, for cussing, for threats, everything. Rolling around out in the yard and the neighbors, they're at it again. And they drive. This is in Gainesville now. So it's a little bit of a larger city. They're at it again and the cops pull up and you know, weed hanging out of my shirt and drunk and everything else. And I never went to jail though. And um, until I said, I just can't do this anymore. I left my second husband at 24 years old. I left my son at four years old. And I said, I'm done. I'm done trying to be responsible. And I lived homeless on the streets of Gainesville, Florida for eight years. I, would, I went from um, probably about 120, 130 down to 80 pounds, rotten teeth, sores all over my face, pick them, matted up hair. I'm, I'm late. I'm, I'm late to everything. I'm, I will not be late to the barbecue, but I'll be late to everything else. I did have some pictures here of some of my mug shots just blow your mind. Um, and you're welcome to pass this around um, and just ignore any call that is going to come through. So uh, you can just pass that around and see the, the depravity of where I went with the rotten teeth, the sores. If I could show you all my mug shots, you'd see black eyes, bloody lips, hair. I had a lot. I was raised in the 80 era, okay? I was a teenager in the 80 era. So I don't even care if you fault me because that's still the best era in time. That's right. Okay, we got one witness. But my hair was big and it was just full of lice and, and filth and dreads because obviously I didn't wash it. I mean, I would stay up seven, eight, nine days in a row chasing that demon called dope, all in the name of dope, getting high, $1,000 a day, turning tricks under the thumb of a pimp left and right um, until my uncle actually became one of my customers on the streets as well and he would purchase me and purchase me and purchase me and I got into a state of hatred hatred I don't know about you but I know that level of murder that the scriptures talk about when you are angry and even hate someone, that it's murder. I get it. I hated this man. When I was seven, I didn't know what to do with that. But when I was 27, I did. I knew what to do with that. I just couldn't. I could not. So I developed that $1,000 a day crack habit. When I couldn't get crack, I was doing heroin, a Mad Dog 2020, whatever I could get my hands on. Anything. I was robbing people, stealing people, everything. I know I've cleaned up well, and I thank Jesus for that. There's like $40,000 in my mouth right now. So it's so 
I want to transition with that. I found myself in that closet at 31, crying out to a God I didn't know. Only thing I knew is how to take his name in vain. That's the only God I knew. And I did. That was my language. That was who I was. That was my identity. The streets were my identity. Drugs were my identity. Alcohol was my identity. It's all I knew. This is normal. I met God in that closet and instantaneously he delivered me. My story is different from a lot of people's. Now don't get it wrong. I don't know how many times I tried to get clean before that. That's the time that he delivered me instantly. So many people, well, why won't he do it for me? Have you asked? So he delivered me instantly, and I walked out of that closet, and I walked into a church with three felony warrants for my arrest. I was always a catch-me-if-you-can kind of person. They did every time. <laughs> I have a three-page arrest record. I'm a convicted felon. People say, well, you don't look like a convicted felon. I'm like, well, what's one supposed to look like? I can help. You know? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, but I don't. And um, so the Lord took me on a journey, though. And he said, Jennifer, if you give me the time to do something with you, I will. I will. I went every time the door was open to a 12-step meeting. I was there. Every time the door was open to a church, I was there. I turned well, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have all the platforms that we have today. We had Sky Angel. Anybody remember Sky Angel? Christian Satellite, $14.95 a month. Get you somewhere. <laughs> okay. Well, I did. Maybe it's a Florida thing. I don't know. Go Gators. But anyway, don't shoot the messenger. So I had Sky Angel. I quit watching all the things that would trigger me because pornography was the trigger for me. Can I just be real? Drugs and alcohol, obviously we talk about that all day long, but do we believe it? I literally had to, I mean, your steps, my goodness, read the scriptures again. So I gave him that time to start working on me. Um, I started getting integrated back into my child's life. I started, um, his dad was very forgiving and let him become part of my life this group of women they had i mean there it was like god jesus holy spirit mother mary mother Teresa, them <laughs> okay i'm like have you ever sinned today in your life <laughs> who are you to tell me and so but they did they nurtured me they're like you know what we're going to take you clothes shopping. <laughs> and I was like, I've got plenty. You know? I didn't. I used to sleep in the dumpster out back of Salvation Army. And when I was in there getting high and sleeping, or not even sleeping, seriously, um, that I would steal outfits from them and I would wear them. That was my clothing. Uh, there were no showers, obviously. So they took me shopping, they cleaned me up, they loved me, they had a meeting. They said, do we keep her? <laughs> it was a project, okay? It was a good project though. So they kept me and they loved me and they did things with me and they talked to me and they nurtured me and they showed me a brand new way. And had I not walked in that church, I would never have met those women with all due respect. I have been in plenty of 12 step circles only. And I always went back out there, always. It wasn't until I got involved in a church and truly surrendered my life to Jesus Christ that things started to turn around. So that was in 2001, 2003. I got my son back, a relationship with my son back, um, started paying him to memorize scripture, do anything, I'd do anything to um, buy his love but I just bought it through the word of God. I knew something about that word of God taking root in his heart. He called me one day and said, Mama, um, you don't need to pay me anymore. I'll memorize it because I love God. 
when he was 14 years old, I baptized my son mm -hmm. in Florida. It was one of the absolute most cherished moments of my life. I did a lot of ministry. I felt like I needed to give back where I came from. And I think that's a, another thing that a lot of addicts struggle with. We, we get so comfortable, even in church. We get so comfortable, and then if we even start to tell our story, we feel shame, as if Jesus didn't take that shame on for us. So we let him take that shame, but I, I, I got called into ministry, and I started telling my stories. Do you know... Do you know what it's like to stand in for four men and say, hey, I was a hooker, <laughs> you know? No, I don't have any shame. Jesus took my shame. He took it. He didn't just take my shame, though. He took my guilt. Every ounce of my guilt. I opened up a residential home in Florida called um, House of Hope where I was taking, I had a 14-bed facility, I was taking women and I did not care. People were like, Jennifer, you hook up on anything, won't you? I'm like, the dirtier, the better. You know, just come on, honey, come home, come home. And I would, I, I had worked with FBI, local law enforcement, federal agents, all, all the people. And um, they, uh, they would bring people in the middle of the night and we would be so full, I'd have them sleeping on the couches and, and pallets on the floor and stuff because I know what it's like to be turned away. Jesus knows what it's like to be turned away. There was no room for him at the end. There's so much of our life that can be connected through scripture. If we would just sit down and take the time to let him connect those dots in our life. Lazarus. I remember one time some guy was hitting on me. He's like, I was like, I'm a Christian. I don't have time. And yeah, he's like, oh, so you know these Bible stuff and all, like who you identify with in the Bible. I said, Rahab. You know? <laughs> Thank you for those who know. Okay. <laughs> and the rest of you, that's your homework assignment. So, you know, like, it's okay. Lazarus, who was a menace to society, so low, sores everywhere. There was so much of me inside of that thing. And I got to learn it and then I got to teach it. I did that for eight years, moved to Kentucky. My son, who is my absolute best friend, we share pulpits all the time. Not only can women get their kids back, but kids get their mamas back. That's our story. That's our story. He got married to a godly woman and he said, mom, we want you to do our wedding. I said, oh, mom, mama's going to cry. You know, I can't do it. He's like, stop the drama, just come on. So I did, and then they got busy, and now I have four grandbabies. So I moved to Kentucky, okay? All right, you're tracking. So I only have a couple more minutes, and we'll have some Q&A time after the break, but I'm going to give just some bullet points. So um, I've been very fortunate to not be ashamed of my story after a certain point. And in that, God has opened so many doors for me to share my story, hence why I'm even here tonight. It's a true honor to be able to do that. Someone said to me, Jennifer, you've got 20 years. You know, is it never enough? Like, are you still there? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I remember the face. I remember laying in fetal positions. I just posted this on my Facebook. I remember laying in a fetal position multiple times, crying profusely, threatening to kill anything that crossed my path because I couldn't get another hit of dope, because I just couldn't lay my body down again. I had already maxed out my credit. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. All the things. And you just get so angry. Suicide is an option. It really is. It is. So I tell my story, 20 years, 10 years, five years, one year, day one. The Lord's opened the door to be on the 700 Club. How cool is that? All right. When they contact me, I'm like, yes, I am Jennifer Beagle. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am. Um, I went on a crash diet. I gained 10 pounds. So <laughs> I like me today. I can, I'm okay. Honestly, I'm okay. 
Um, but I speak, I've traveled the world. I used to have to get permission to leave the county. Yeah? Right. Show of hands. <laughs> Rocking, okay. <laughs> Good to see some familiar faces. It is. Anyway, uh, but they let me out of the country. And I went, I went to Africa, been to Mexico three times, Guatemala, Israel twice. I've walked where Jesus has walked. I serve where Jesus has served. I've been to Belgium, Japan, Thailand, working in the sex trade industry. Things that are just close to my heart. I'm like, honey, I'll leave the country every time you let me. <laughs> I beg for that 1500 Please let me go. So um, traveled all around the world, telling my story. There's a scripture in chapter 26 that says, Surely where the gospel is preached, her story will be told. And that was prophesied over me about a year in. And every once in a while, the Lord would take me back to remember that scripture and that he's not done with me yet. I won an award. I, um, I got a phone call in 2018, and they said, hey, this is special agent, somebody from headquarters in Jacksonville, Florida, the FBI. I'm like, I know nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I didn't do it. I've been out of it. I'm, I'm good. And they said, well, we actually want to recognize you. We see your leadership in our community, Gainesville, Florida. We see the work that you do in the anti-sex trafficking movement and with drug addiction with those who are incarcerated. And we want to fly you to Washington, D.C. to go receive the nation's highest award. Oh, wow. 365 million people in this country. And they called me. Yeah. I have an eighth grade education. Still. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Still. Right? What? I adopted two kids from the Florida foster care system because their parents were like me. And it kind of trickled down and boom, there it is. Now I'm regretting it. No kidding. So, <laughs> I love you if you're watching. Um, <laughs> Anyway, there's so much that the Lord has done. That's my alarm. It's gone off twice. I know. I know. I've got two minutes. I can wrap this up. Thank take, you, Dennis. Take your time as much as Well, in know. that case. <laughs> Depends on who's got to pee. In right? <laughs> anyway, there's so much that the Lord has done in my life. I was on alcohol and drugs from 9 to 31. That's 22 years. I was a full-blown alcoholic from 11 to 31. That's 20 years. I've been sober 20 years. I've got two more. That's right. I've got two more. And I'm going to live those two more to the fullest. I am... Um, I'm in the process of opening up um, a, a residential home here. I currently work in the anti-sex trafficking movement. I mentor teenagers. Don't do it. But um, pray. It's hard. It's hard because they're so naive and vulnerable and coerced. It's not a poverty issue. It's not. It's an entitlement to some. Like it, it's in every home here. Kentucky is number nine in the nation for sex trafficking. Number one for opioid addiction. Number three for child abuse. You put all of that together, and then you have why I'm here. So we'll be opening up, Lord willing, in the next couple of months, a residential home because just seeing you week after week is not enough sometimes. It's really not. If you need to go into a facility, swallow your pride and go, or you're going to die in your addiction. You've seen plenty and many. Yeah. I have mentored people here who are dead today. Y'all know who. And it breaks my heart because I know the answer. 
I know that it's Jesus, but not just Jesus, it's community. It's this nice big word right here, community. If those women had not embraced me, if they had sent me out like so many in the church, do I clean up well, but that wasn't day one, okay? If they had sent me out like so many have, I have a persistent spirit, they taught me what true community looks like. If you take the word community, you have common unity. Everybody today is affected by addiction. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say. It's no respecter of person. It is absolutely out to kill, steal, and destroy <coughs> you and your family. But God sent his son that you would have life, and that you would have it abundantly. I don't live in that anymore, and it took a minute, but I gave him the minute. I crawled out of every hole, every debt. Every, I just bought my first house. I bought, not rented. <laughs> I bought it. And I'm like, wow. Ah. I can't, I, I don't have time. I'm going to give you two scriptures. We're going to take a break and then come back and ask questions about my kids, about my son, about addiction, about recovery, about this church, anything, anything. Because the Lord told me my very first ministry was a ministry of transparency and that if I always said yes, so would he. And that if I just told the truth, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was a sinner headed straight for hell and laughed every day about it. And then he found me. And he got, I cry every time amazing grace comes on. Here's my family. Here's my whole family. Squint your eyes. <laughs> there is a new baby since this picture. <coughs> they are still busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's cliche almost in the church it's really cliche Jeremiah 29 11 you can quote it everyone quotes it but do you believe it for I know the plans that I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you not harm you. God is not your problem. He's not your enemy. It's not his fault. There is a very real enemy who hates the very air you breathe. Just like I hated my uncle, I led him to the Lord. I forgave him. I drove right up into Trenton, Florida, knocked on that trailer door, and I prayed with him and I forgave him. I had to. I'd have died in my hatred. I led my pimp to the Lord. I used to feed homeless for years in Florida. And he walked up one day. I'm like, oh, Lord. God is not here to harm me. And ultimately, they're alive without Christ, and neither were they. They were just living in their own self-hatred. So I introduced them to a God that loves and loves well. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And when you look up, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. When you look that up, it is cunning, intentional, and sharp. Those are God's thoughts toward me and you. They're intentional. Job, if you've read the Bible at all, though he slay me, I will still praise his name. A lot of stuff. But these aren't just Bible stories. These are real stories. Just like mine. Just like yours. And then my favorite life scripture is Philippians 1.12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, because so many people, oh, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. I'm so sorry. That's what I tell my one-year-old grandbaby when they get a boo-boo. Okay? <laughs> I got something for you prison style. Okay. <laughs> and all my felons said. <laughs> Leave it there. 
That which has happened to me has actually happened to me to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get your story and get busy. You can do this. You need a lot of help. And that's okay. It is okay to need help. My God, my God. Jesus cried out for help. And he's the name above all names. All right, so that's my story. Hey, y'all take a break. And then barefoot and all, <laughs> I'd love to have some questions. Okay, thank you. Let's take five minutes, y'all. If you need a restroom break, or there's some snacks and drinks in the back, um, just take a couple minutes and we'll start back. <laughs>